Dan, I think we're ready to get started. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, can you all hear me? Fantastic. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for for joining us today. Um, my name is Dan Toscano. Um, I am a managing director at Morgan Stanley um, in uh, in New York City. Uh, I'm a UConn grad, 1987, um, and uh, a veteran of the UConn Foundation Board, where I spent 11 years. And um, uh, two years ago, the governor asked me to uh, join the board of trustees, which I uh, I now chair that board. So um, I am all in on UConn. Um, always have been. Uh, I also have a, a senior uh, who's graduating in a couple of months uh, from UConn. So um, I'm a parent as well as a, as well as a grad and a donor and a trustee um, and anything else I can be to uh, uh, to UConn. Um, in addition to that, um, I am. Uh, I was told I'm a girl dad. Um, and I was kind of afraid to say that because I'm, I, I'm not sure, uh, sometimes words can get you in trouble, but I am, I'm the uh, very, very proud parent of the smartest person in our family, which is my 18 year old daughter, Olivia, uh, who's a senior in high school. And, um, I can tell you having raised two boys and, 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 uh, raising a daughter, uh, and for those of you who are parents of both, you know what I mean when I say, wow, what a different experience that is. Um, but it's really been the joy. She is um, uh, absolutely the highlight of my life. And um, it's been a real fun seeing the world through her eyes as she's um, as she's approaching adulthood. Um, the Women in Philanthropy program um, is an element of UConn that I am particularly um, proud of. Um, and to say I'm a part of it doesn't do it justice. Um, when it was being formed, it just seemed to me like this is such a great idea and opportunities to unleash um, this topic um, with um, with our Yukon Nation was just a, was a no brainer. Um, and for the people who put it together, um, I would just put, take my hat off to them because they've done an amazing job. I don't have the details in front of me, but I think if I have it right, uh, over eight million dollars has been raised in support of this initiative, um, which is really incredible um, from a wide variety of, of sources. So, um, you know, hats off to uh, the folks at UConn and all the volunteers who helped um, had the vision to make women in philanthropy um, a really important component of, um, of what UConn does. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, uh, gender balance leadership. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the paradigm for uh, for a parity movement, uh, which started about five years ago and brought people together in the corporate world um, to address this gender gap um, with one goal in mind, which was to achieve full gender parity by 2030. Um, and I'm proud to say many of the companies who uh, our panelists uh, work for uh, signed on to that pledge and, uh, and are well represented here today, as is my firm. Um, the women on this panel, uh, who you'll meet in a moment, represent what we hope will soon be the norm, intelligent, innovative leaders who also happen to be women. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists to, um, to introduce themselves, and I would just encourage you, do not be modest. Um, you are um, you have a very successful backgrounds and, and would like you to share that with, and if you if you are too modest, I will embellish uh, your backgrounds with some of the facts you leave out. So maybe Barbara, if we can start with you, and then we'll go to Libby, Rupa, Shannon, and then we'll get into some of our discussion. Sounds great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, my name is Barbara Paremba, and I am Vice President of National Retail Sales at the Coca-Cola Company. Um, I have spent the majority of my career in consumer products companies. So Noxell, Polaroid, and Coca-Cola for the last 16. I lead uh, a team across the country that serves CVS Health and 8,000 stores across 400 brands, uh, and we bring that to life. Uh, personally, I'm committed to helping others reach their full potential. Um, so organizations like the Yukon Foundation that invest in our future leaders is a personal passion point for me, uh, and I'm really excited to join the Yukon Foundation Board. 
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Libby Saylor Wright, and I am so happy to be here with you today. I have over 20 years of industry experience, both on the agency and the corporate side of the business, primarily in consumer packaged goods as well. I have spent a lot of that time focusing on food and beverage, primarily due to my time at the Coca-Cola Company, where I spent 13 years in six different roles, ranging from marketing to strategy to sales operations and innovation. After leaving the Coca-Cola Company, I had the opportunity to go to the Women's Food Service Forum. And so for many of you who know what the Women's Food Service Forum is, it's right in the wheelhouse of what we're talking about today. The Women's Food Service Forum is a nonprofit that's about accelerating the advancement of women in the food industry. And I had the opportunity to serve as their chief operating officer while I was there. And then if it's not obvious by the big logo behind my head, I am now at Microsoft where I have the privilege of being the chief of staff for our retail and consumer goods group. And we are responsible, or I'm responsible for strategy, for sales operations, for performance management, and also for team and culture. So thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. To unmute myself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rupa Krishnan, class of 05. So glad to be here. Uh, let me start with a fun fact uh, that I was, uh, I passed out of UConn Stanford, but I was originally admitted to the UConn uh, campus at Storrs, but I was newly married then and, the, and my husband, we were living in Trumbull at the time. And the thought of, you know, uh, staying apart didn't quite, uh, you know, bode well with us. And that's when uh, you know, I decided to move to the Stanford campus. Um, uh, I've been in Connecticut all my life, and it's uh, you know, it's, it's a not only is it a great place, but it's given me so much. Um, after I finished UConn, uh, I joined a uh, I joined in strategic partnerships for a company that worked with banks in in selling value added services uh, to customers of bank holders, bank card holders. I was there for about six years, and that's when this technology bug, like I like to call it, bug bit me. And I wanted to be with engineers, and I had this, this thing that I want to build great products. I want to work with engineers, although I'm no engineer myself. Uh, but, you know, such is the power of intention uh, that I found myself, uh, you know, at MasterCard not too long from then, where I was doing just that. So uh, that's when my wonderful journey in building digital capabilities started. Uh, I was there at MasterCard for a little over five years when I discovered this other fintech out of New York called Betterment, which called me to be their, the head of their B2B products uh, and to do, you know, build more uh, capabilities now in the area of financial services, digital advice and robo advisory platforms that I'm sure you all have heard of. Um, and I also served as a line of business lead or general manager for their Betterment for Business line. Um, it was great to go from a company of several thousands to a company of 250, and I had a fantastic time there. Uh, but then came along uh, this great company called American Express, uh, to, and they offered me a position to lead their network products group. Couldn't say no to it. So here I am, still doing more of the same, building great products, digital capabilities, and bringing them to our cardholders around the world. Um, I will say that the most fulfilling, and this is not cliche, I really mean it when I say this, the most enriching part of my, my job is uh, meeting people uh, and owning and mentoring teams and bringing us all to our full potential. And of course, uh, holding the door open to the, the younger ones, such as you know many of you who are passing out of college or are in college and thinking about your futures. Uh, I'm excited and uh, it's because of that that I'm here in a panel in this panel today excited to share my experiences share my thoughts and also you know hopefully get to know a whole new group of, uh, uh, of students and see how can we help. Uh, Shannon Lapierre um, I'm a 1993 UConn grad my father and my older sister were also UConn grads so uh, my lullaby songs were the Yukon fight songs. So I think my father was you know, trying to get me to go to Yukon from, from a very young age. Um, so I'm now the uh, chief communications officer at Stanley Black and Decker. So based in New Britain, Connecticut, where we were founded 177 years ago and the company's still, still based there today. Um, 
I, uh, I oversee a, a, a broad kind of swath of, of accountabilities related to communication. So our corporate communications, our corporate branding and corporate marketing and sponsorship, philanthropy, our government relations work, and really spend a lot of time also working closely on our diversity, equity, and in inclusion efforts. Um, started my career actually in, in a corporate communications department at the Travelers. I was uh, a graduate of UConn. I was going to graduate a semester early and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Ended up enrolling in a cooperative education program for six months where you work full time in a, in a company and just fell in love with, with the work um, because it's a great field and where you can learn everything about how a company runs and operates from the marketing to the finances to the legal side uh, to product development and enabled me to work across a number of different industries. So I've worked in high tech and retail in financial services and now for a, a global manufacturing industrial um, company, which has been really exciting. And while you might not normally think about a tool company or global industrial is being very diversity minded. I, you know, I'm really proud of, of the company and the work that we've done there and really recognizing how critical to, to our growth and our talent and our, our recruitment um, being a more diverse and inclusive company is uh, to, to what we've done and some of the work we've done since I've been there has been really around excavating our purpose being for those who make the world. Uh, which really took on a new meeting this past year in the pandemic. So when you think about the types of products and services our, our company offers, it's really for the people who are out there on the front lines every day, the essential workers doing the hard work every day um, to build, construct, manage, protect, um, and grow the world around us and build that world. And our, our employees are very, very proud of that and, and, um, and what they do for for the world in terms of making those tools of tools available. Um, and that really ties into our diversity work and, and uh, our CEO is very passionate about these, about these topics and about community. And we had uh, labeled 2020, the, the year of the woman at the beginning of 2020 back in January, pre-pandemic. Pre and it was interesting because we, we had a great celebration for International Women's Day last year, kicking off in March. Um, we had all these great activities planned over the course of the year, which many of them got put hold when we went into crisis mode on the, on the manufacturing front. Um, and I know we'll talk about a lot of these topics uh, today, but I, it was so interesting reflecting back of all the things we didn't do that we had planned, but yet the pandemic, like in so many other areas, accelerated so many things about um, making the workplace more equitable for women. And, and a few of us were talking on this panel before we got started about opportunities to not necessarily have to live exactly where your company might want you to and that flexibility and freedom and, and how it accelerated virtual work. And then even the equality with Zoom, right? So when everyone is a, a square on a box, it doesn't matter as much as you know who's the bigger person in the room or, or who has the better looking office and things like that. And then when you can put a quick Zoom backdrop, it doesn't even matter if I have a better home than yours. Um, and just kind of how how one of the the you know few positive outcomes. There's been so many um, tragic tragic things related to the pandemic, but it it has in some ways um, advanced some of those while also putting additional demands on women as well too. Well, thank you for that. And, and uh, you know, for, for all of those intros, um, we could sit here for a few hours just talking about the path that you all took um, to end up where you are, because I imagine the lessons that are um, embedded in those paths would be incredible. So, Maggie, maybe we can get this group together for a separate conversation that just talks about, um, given the time frame in which um, you all progressed your lives and your careers, um, how you did it, um, because it's, um, it's certainly not, not easy. Um, and it's a very interesting time. Um, you know, for, for me, I, you know, I'm a manager of a large group of people here. Um, and I would say that coming from the vantage point, um, that I look at the world, um, mostly what I've learned over the last five years is what I didn't know and what I didn't realize. Um, and you really have to train your brain to think differently. Um, 
And uh, I, I credit the people around me who helped me understand and, and were willing to let me ask stupid questions like, why does that word bother you? Or, you know, why did you let that happen? Um, educate me. And, um, and uh, you know, I just feel like it's a different world. Um, I've been in this world for 30 years um, and I've never seen it the way it is today. And, and not just as it relates to gender, um, but a whole host of social issues. And um, so in a way, one of my worries uh, over the course of the past year was um, that we not f drop every all the work we're doing around gender uh, equality and, and development and start, you know, focusing solely on, on other topics. And so um, it's really, uh, I think, incumbent upon all of us to, to manage all of the opportunities that are in front of us um, and not run from one to another. Um, so thank you guys all for, uh, for introducing yourselves. Um, and may, maybe um, I have a couple of questions that um, I'm going to throw at the panelists and, and we can, uh, we can discuss them. Um, and, and really on the point I was making about the paths that, that you all have in Rupa, maybe we'll start with you if, if you don't mind. Um, maybe just frame this for us. How would you, how would you describe the current status of gender equality um, and particularly, particularly in leadership? Um, you, you are all leaders of your organization. So I really want to focus on that and maybe give us a sense of, how it's evolved over the past decade, um, and maybe how you see it playing playing out as we move forward. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I think this very question um, tells us where we are, is a, is a reflection of where we are, right? I mean, all of us are leaders, uh, and when you're a leader, you know, we, we all have teams. Uh, my team sits, uh, I have teams that are spread across Europe, South uh, uh, Europe. Uh, and Sydney, Australia, in addition to the US. Um, and the fact that we are even discussing this question tells us the state of where we are. Um, so it means that, you know, simply that there is awareness around this topic. And that's something, there is something here that it needs the amount of attention and uh, conversation uh, and focused efforts around it to make this, uh, to, to make this topic, I'll say, go away. Sorry, I'm answering your question uh, in my very first sentence. Um, so uh, th that says something about it, right? I mean, uh, if, you, if I compare it to uh, 10 years ago, if I compare the current state to 10 years ago, I think it was, in my opinion, I was also newer in the workforce than I was in the workforce for about five years then. I think it was just a topic that was uh, adjacent, adjacent to the work that we were doing. Like, uh, you know, it wasn't... Uh, there was some awareness that something has to be done, but it was never at center stage. It was never talked about. It never became the focus of uh, attention or conversation around it. Uh, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, ten years uh, 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 ten years ago, I was, you know, probably a manager or a director. Uh, my, my, I, I worked with many women. I had maybe women leaders, but when I look at the leadership team, the C suite, and the managing directors they were all men. And at that time, you know, the awareness of that picture doesn't look uh, very right to me that even that awareness wasn't so ingrained, right? Uh, but I will say, having said that, that throughout my career, um, and I was thinking about this, every one of my hiring leaders has been a woman. Now, obviously, you know, as you advance in leadership positions, you know, you go through rounds of interviews and sometimes there is a panel Men were always a part of the decision, uh, but it was a woman that woman that hired me. And what is what that tells me, and what I take away from that is, we owe it as women in leadership positions, and even as men in leadership positions, to hold the door open for others, right? To hold the door open for those, uh, you know, coming uh, for those next to us or coming behind us, so that this picture can change. Um, and, you know, when I look at what the situation can, should be, you know, what I would like to see in the future, I would like to see this topic go away. That would be a sign that it's that gender equality in leadership is there. I mean, think about if I compare it, let me compare it to women voting, right? Like, do we talk about it? It's just there. We know it. We do it. We are strong, stronger and better because of it. Uh, so, you know, when I'd like the same thing to happen, uh, I'd like to see the same things 
uh, in leadership situations also where, uh, you know, it's there, uh, it's, it's, uh, we are stronger because of it, we are smarter because of it. And I think in order to get there, little things are what matter. And that li those little things are, what do we as women and men do when we have a seat at the table, when we are making decisions, when we are making hiring decisions, how we choose to spend our time, who do we mentor, and what is our message when we mentor? So uh, that's where I stand, um, and I think uh, you know uh, uh, my vision for this topic, my measure of success is this topic just going away. It's not important, and it's it's just there. So if you were to try to um, put it on a scale um, in terms of um, where we were a decade ago versus where we are now. I don't, you pick the scale, whether it's like a grading mm -hmm. scale or a mm -hmm. one to 10. Uh, I'm curious from your vantage point, where were we in 2011 on that scale and when, where are we today? I would say if I take a 10 point scale uh, with uh, one being very poor and 10 being very good, uh, uh, I would say 10 years ago, we were at number three. And I think we've made phenomenal progress uh, since then. I mean, the mandate that you know all public traded companies have to have a woman in their board and uh, so much of attention uh, and even investment choices being made on the strength of you know diversity and inclusiveness. I would say we are at a solid uh, 6.5. And I'd be very curious to hear my fellow panelists. You know, maybe we can we can we can do this. I'd like you all to. Uh, you know, to take a, take your, give us your estimate of where you think you are uh, on that scale. Sorry, Dan, I'm taking your role. <laughs> no, it's, per it's perfect. I was going to suggest the same thing. So yeah. couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. So I, six? I, I see Barbara said a six. I'm going to give us actually a little bit less than that. I'm going to give us a five or 5.5. 5. That's where I would say that we are at this particular time uh, until organizations like the Network for Executive Women, like the Women's Food Service Forum, like Catalyst, like all of those organizations until they no longer have to exist at all. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna be a little bit more uh, probably critical as to where we are. And I think another thing that Rupa had to say, which is critically important, is that she indicated that all of her jobs were hot. She was hired by women and that there might've been men making the decision, but she was hired by women. And there is a statistic that says, even if you add just one more woman to an interview slate, so you have an interview slate and you mm -hmm. add one, you have one woman, but you add one more. So now you have two women, the likelihood of course doubles that, that, woman, that a woman will actually get the role. But then when you add a woman to the panel of interviewers, then it increases the likelihood even more. So that representation and that need for women to be in seats today in order to advance where we need to get to tomorrow is critically important. And so you touched on something that was just amazing and important, Rupa. And I think- That's the, great. The, Shannon, what do you think? I, I, I agree somewhere between five and 6.5 sounds about right. And I, and I think the, the reason is I think there's a lot more openness, a lot more discussion, which is very positive. But when you go and look at the numbers, the, the, the metrics haven't shifted very much over the last 10 years. And that's, that's the one that um, you know, is very difficult for companies to really get their heads around. And the, the transparency around those numbers and the moves, I think, is really important because I think companies and people feel like they're working really hard towards gender equality, but in many cases, those numbers just aren't representing the effort that's being put in. And I think that's why Paradigm for Parity is, has kind of called out their, their five um, pillars there to really get folks aligned around the things that they believe and research shows can really make a meaningful difference. Well, I think you guys are all very generous graders. Uh, because I was kind of at a three. So uh, it just goes to show you what I know. Um, my thought on it was um, we're, we're, we haven't even gotten through in awareness, awareness uh, or enlightenment yet. Um, so we're pretty early on in this. Um, and to me, you get to 10 when it becomes second nature. Uh, it doesn't need assistance. It doesn't need um, the sort of resources that uh, organizations, um, corporate and volunteer, um, are putting into the subject. So I, I kind of feel like we have, 
we have a long way to go. Um, and as a, you know, as a person in, in corporate America, I feel like this is really the first time where I have an organ. Miss Morgan Stanley is a very large organization, 65,000 employees, uh, where I feel like the organization is behind trying to help me figure out how to make our organi- organization better on, on this topic. Um, which tells me we're really only only just starting to scratch the surface. I mean, the the amount of scientific research out there um, is pretty profound, and it's so clear cut that I don't think there's a whole lot of debate um, on what the research says um, can really drive success. Um, so t- I'm just a little frustrated that uh, that it's taken so long, and we have a long way to go. Um, but at least we're sort of getting on to um, – a paved road where we can really start uh, start to make some progress. So I'm going to pivot into a slightly um, different topic, but it actually relates to this. And, and maybe these are all so interconnected. But um, Shannon, um, let's talk about allies. Allyship has been um, uh, a word that has really ca- you know caught been caught in the vernacular. Um, I find myself looking up words all the time. Um, and I, it kind of bothers me because I feel like a lot of times, a lot of the d- debate that goes on in the world um, is really about the definition of words rather than um, w- what to do with them. And so uh, I've learned the hard way that if you don't know exactly what a word means, you better find out. Uh, so ask somebody who knows or at least you know, start with Google and, and see. Um, and there are just a ton of words out there. Um, and I think allyship is one of the... Um, one of the more important um, and one that can, you know, take, let an individual really make a difference. So um, I just wonder if, if maybe you could talk a little bit about that um, and how y- you would encourage women to, um, to utilize allies. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because I think in, in recent years, this, this idea of kind of a Format, formal ally, allyship programs, I can't even say the word, allyship programs um, and supporters and, and mentoring programs and supporters has been uh, top of mind. And it's something where, where women don't necessarily always have that infrastructure and support either within companies or, or with, with um, connections outside the company to have the support to elevate within an organization. But I always just think of it in pretty simple terms. It's, it's you know, helping people, right? Having people that help you and you helping other people. But part of, I think, the challenge is sometimes recognizing when someone needs that help. So the other thing we talk a lot about, um, we use Gallup as our employee engagement survey, and they talk about having a best friend at work. And people who have a best friend at work are more highly engaged, more likely to stay with an organization. And that best friend at work is is an ally, right? Someone who has your back, they'll give you the truth, they'll give you the feedback that you need, they'll support you during meetings. Um, So that's one way of looking at it. The other one is, is who do you call on for support? So I think the the one thing, and I've learned uh, in recent years is is being able to ask for help and recognizing that I might need it, right? Which is something that, that took me a very long time to figure out which is, you know, when you're in a, any marginalized group, um, whether it's by race or, or gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or just a diverse opinion, right, in a, in a group setting, uh, you know, recognizing that you, you probably need help, right, and you need that support and being, being aware enough to go and ask for that help. So if you've got a big presentation at a meeting and you're, you're worried that that's, it's not going to be well received or people aren't going to get your point, to go to to go to an ally before the meeting and say, hey, um, I'm going to do this topic. I'm kind of worried about where things are going to go. I need you to because you're a person that's going to have influence in that meeting. And it could be a male, it could be a, a female, doesn't matter, right? Someone who has some influence and power in that setting and say, after I finish my presentation, it would be really helpful if you said something positive about that. And we've all been in those situations where you've done a presentation, your great idea, great work, and someone in that meeting who's a naysayer, uh, either on you or or your gender or your race or is not a supporter, drops something in the meeting, very negative, and it turns the whole tide of that meeting. And those those moments of truth like that for for women, 
for other marginalized groups can be kind of the, the kiss of death per se on, on whole careers, right? Can change a trajectory, those, those, those simple moments. And being aware enough um, to, to ask for that help. And then for, for someone like you to be aware enough to know what's going on in that meeting and understand the dynamics of the room to be able to be the one to offer that even when you're not asked. So when I think of allyship, it's the it's the person that steps in when when you, and can recognize that that person needs just a little bit of lift. And by giving that, you in a positive way can change a whole trajectory of a career. You know, that can be the moment that that person gets the assignment that sends their career sailing. Um, and without that support in those meetings, particularly for folks from marginalized communities, if, if they don't get that, it, it, it can really um, really be a real downfall. So the, when I think of allyship, that's that's what I think of. And, and for that to happen in a more natural way, but for people to recognize the role that they can play in those settings, it's really pretty, um, pretty phenomenal when it does happen in a positive way. So I'm gonna go off script a little bit and, uh, and throw this out to the group um, because you've articulated some um, really powerful benefits to uh, having allies. And so I guess the question I have is someone who um, is a willing ally, um, and I'm overtly an ally to several people in my organization, um, but I've spent a lot of time getting coached by people on how to make that happen. You know, it's one thing to um, want to do it. It's another thing to know how to do it. Um, as, as a person looking for an ally, what advice do you have for people? I'm sure there was some point in all of your careers where maybe you felt like you didn't have uh, allies like that. And then there was a point where um, you had the self-confidence to go find the right allies and utilize them and, and take from them what they're, you know, what they're capable of, of providing in terms of support. Like I, I just see, like, I, I don't, I've been blessed, right, because of who I am and, and what my profile is, that I've had a lot of allies that have naturally formed. I've never had to think about it. So how, when you have to help be part of the solution for yourself, how do you, how do, you do that? I think you road test some of it first, right? So you seek out people that you believe can be um, supportive of your position. And I think you, you do the one-on-one -on -one conversations like Sharon, Shannon spoke to, like, I need to go present this. I'm concerned about these areas. Could I practice with you? Will you poke holes through my challenge or my problem so that they're preparing me in advance for things that I may not have anticipated? And then after you build trust with a few of those individuals, that's when you can proactively do exactly what Shannon just mentioned, which is, um, will you follow up in that discussion, will you start the, the trajectory towards this direction? But I think I, I road test things before I take it to a public audience. So, so for somebody who doesn't have an ally today, if someone's watching us talk and they say, oh my God, like I, you know, I don't have allies, I need allies. It must be scary as hell to know that maybe I need to do something to, to get that ball rolling. Um, and I imagine maybe you would all say there have been times in my life where I didn't quite have the confidence to, to, to cross that bridge and say, you know, would you be my ally? Um, are you invested in me? Will you, will you be part of my success? Um, and if that, if not, then say, no, you're just a dope. Don't, uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, but if you have like, just share a story of how you cross that bridge as, as daunting as it might seem. Yeah, I want to jump in here. Um, you know, maybe I, I don't have a story. As All right, don't call me a dope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't want our audience to think that you need an ally always because, you know, having an ally has its benefits, but I don't want anyone to think that, you know, it's a uh, it's a crutch that you need and that without it, your position is weaker. I would say own it. Uh, I saw a question come here and, and uh, Dan, maybe you're gonna get, uh, you, you'll get to it. Um, I, I, I 
you know, maybe because of some of my experiences uh, or, you know, j just, uh, you know, some, the, some ways in which things are wired together in my head, uh, you really need to have, uh, the conviction that you have in yourself will carry you pretty darn far, ally or no ally. I would say, you know, sorry if this comes out a bit strongly, but I think as women, if we have goals of, you know, being the president of the country or being on leadership boards, I think the first person we ought to rely on is ourselves. And so go in with the feeling that, you know, be prepared, do your homework, work really hard, develop soft skills to read the room, be on point, be on message, do your best. And if there is a bomb in the room, go back afterwards and ask, you know, and, you know, even if it is to the person who dropped the bomb, ask them, what could you have done? What, what would he or she have dif expected differently? What could you have done differently? And I always say this, in careers, hold your naysayers closest. They are your biggest source of feedback. And, uh, you know, the more you can uh, you know, uh, eat your ego or whatever is standing in your way and say, okay, this person had some things to say about the situation. Let me go and tackle that head on. I think you carry yourself much farther along. So my message is, and my experience has been, allies are great, uh, but I don't want anyone to go into a situation thinking they need allies. And B, if you don't have allies and if you do your work, you will naturally develop them and you can always, you know, go back and ask for feedback, um, you know, uh, ask for what could I have done differently, you know, have a more uh, constructive conversation based on your strengths than thinking uh, without this, uh, you know, you're not going to be there. I just want everyone to think, uh, you know, they are, uh, you're capable, you've studied just as hard, the person sitting next to you uh, has some of uh, has many of the same uh, thoughts that you have. So it's the only difference is who chooses to speak up, who chooses to put themselves out there and put your ideas on the table and be strong enough to take the reactions that come back to it. And if we have this courage and this confidence in ourselves, we'll go very far with or without allies. And the only thing I want to add to that is define for yourself and be very clear as to exactly what an ally is as well. You, every one of us has the opportunity to be an ally to someone. So while you're looking for an ally to support you from a gender perspective or from a woman of color or from a whatever it is, think of how are you an ally to others where you need to be. That helps you develop those skills and know exactly what it is you're looking for. And you will recognize when someone is there to support you across some of these things where you may be socially marginalized. So I think, ask yourself, am I an ally as well? Yeah, and, and that's a very good point uh, that you made, Libby. And I dare say that as such as everything in life, what goes around comes around. So if you focus on being an ally first, you may be, you know, it doesn't matter, your level, your ranks doesn't matter. No ma Even if it is a CEO of the company, if you walk up to that person and said, hey, you did, uh, whatever you said there resonated with me, they're going to feel good about it. And the more of those positive feelings, those encouraging feelings that you put out there, that's what you're going to, that's what's going to come to you also. So I agree a hundred percent. Try to focus on being an ally, just more in your control. You will, and, you know, developing allies will come naturally. Wow. That I, I wouldn't have fully expected that. Um, but you guys are very, very strong. Um, I think it takes a lot of courage and um, to believe in yourself like that, um, regardless of of who you are. Um, I'm going to go a little bit out of um, out of sequence and ask Barbara a question um, because I think it's a natural uh, follow up. But um, talk about sponsors. Um, and uh, the term I was given was personal board of directors. Um, I don't quite know. Uh, fully what that means, but maybe just talk about um, how you see sponsorship, how it's affected you, and um, and how you found sponsorship. Yeah, so personal board of directors is, is kind of a term I like to use for people in my life that I seek counsel and advice from, trusted advisors. So where they come from are multiple sources. Some are from formal programs, you know, mentoring programs that you've been set up with a senior leader, um, that has that you talk about career and development conversations. 
Others have been through volunteer work through, so Libby mentioned Network for Executive Women, which I'm very actively involved in. And I, um, and an executive, I'm an executive sponsor for the New England chapter. And being involved with others that help me to get different perspectives um, has been incredibly valuable. And then candidly, um, many of my longtime advisors are on this call right now. So many of my uh, fellow Yukon Huskies that were sorority sisters in college that continue to be advisors many years down the road in life and career. The ones that will tell you that will, uh, when you bring a challenge or a problem, will be totally candid with you and say, yeah, you're thinking about it this way, but I see a different perspective or a different path for you and can be totally and completely honest with you. So what I would tell you is how you show up with mentors and advisors is what creates sponsors. So an example of that is when I've been in formal mentoring relationships, so think president of North America, um, I prepared for every single formal meeting that I went to. I had something for him that I could add value. I had something that I wanted to learn. And then I, I sought his career counsel on how I might think about different, different uh, aspects or roles, how I could get stretch assignments. So once I was having active dialogues and showing up um, with content and reliability, those people were sponsoring me when I didn't ask. When they were in meetings where my name could be brought up, I didn't have to ask for a sponsor. I had already proven to them that I would deliver and that if they recommended me for an assignment, I was gonna follow through and make them look good. So I would tell you, um, whether it is accountability buddies through you know, goal setting and career counsel, whether it is the person you go to for trusted advice, even when you, it's a hard conversation, when you, you're getting feedback on things that you can do better or stretch um, further. Um, those are the kind, that's the kind of counsel that helps you to be stronger and better in the long run. And those people, when they see you following through on their recommendations, become advocates and sponsors for you. That's been my experience. Libby, any thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. Um, I too have a board of directors. I can't add very much more to that. But what I would say is that um, your board of directors that include your personal friends also do understand not only your career aspirations, but understand what your core values are as a human. And understanding your core values as a human, this whole notion of being able to bring your entire self to work and therefore being able to perform better means that they can challenge you when you're stepping outside of your core values, because you're never going to show up as your best self if you're walking away from your core values. And then the only other thing I would add is when you talked about stretch assignments, Barb, that's perfect. And also it needs to be very specific stretch assignments. There are a lot of women in roles that we would have historically thought of as roles that were more for women. You need to stretch yourself into roles if you aspire for leadership that have PL responsibility, that have technical responsibility, various things that that we have historically not necessarily been given the opportunity to do, but are extremely important to your career advancement. So look for those stretch assignments that give you new skills that'll help you uh, build on who you already are. Great, Libby. I think that's a, a great one too on the career path because mine has been you know a traditional female you know, um, career path in terms of the field that I'm in, which I, which I love. And I, and I, I don't have regrets from that perspective, but one of the things that's been on my to-do list and I've, I've tried to do and am, am dedicating to do more of is get more women on my junior women on my team into more operator roles who have, you know, great talents and skills and put them in kind of those non-traditional gender roles um, to help the company uh, overall, because I think that will make a, a great difference. And then I can bring more, more folks into our team, but you're right. I, I don't think um, leaders and managers are necessarily as deliberate around pur purposely career pathing folks into those PNL and non-traditional um, female roles for sure. What do you, what do you think the, um, like, what are the next walls to get knocked down in that regard? I mean, I, I feel like maybe um, 
early on in my career, as I was observing the world, people were put into boxes, right? And you just, um, you know, you stayed in, in that box. Um, I mean, myself included, I've been really doing the same thing basically for 30 years. Um, and the world we live in today, we encourage our young people to take risk, um, do different things. Um, half, half of the team that works for me is under the age of 30. Um, and I tell our um, all the high, you know, we hire uh, out of undergrad for two years. Um, so they're here for two and then we figure it out from there. Um, and I encourage them all after that two years, like try something else. You know, a lot of them come to me and say, I really enjoy this. I'm learning a lot. I want to keep doing it. And I say, you're extraordinarily talented. You're one of our best people. Go do something else. And they look at me like, why don't you want me here? And I'm like, I, I, I want you back. You know, I want you to go do something um, to keep rounding yourself out. Um, and if you still want to come back in two years, like there, there'll always be a seat for you. Um, but now's the time to take the risk. Um, so I'm sort of curious what you think the uh, impediments are today, because in this area, I do think there's been a lot of um, evolution of thinking that's not gender or race um, specific. It's for all people to, um, you know, the idea of you, you know, you get the job at the company and you become a company person um, doesn't exist to the extent it used to. Yeah, no, it, it, that's a really incredible and important point. I think, have you ever heard of the notion, and Brene Brown says this all the time, about the stories we tell ourselves? So I think part of it is that the organization in the world has told us that women do a really great job at marketing and women are really, really good at communication and they're really good at HR and maybe now this DNI thing. And so I think we tell ourselves those stories sometimes as women that, oh, I, I don't know that I'd want to do a supply chain role that that's probably not in my wheelhouse or I'm not really sure. So we start to tell ourselves these stories. The first thing is we got to get rid of the stories. The second thing is decide what your long term goal is and then work backwards from that. Nothing that has ever been achieved has been achieved necessarily by happenstance. So think about where do I want to be? And that doesn't have to be a very specific role at a specific company, but it should have characteristics of what you want your long term future to be and then work back. I kind of accidentally did fall into, I started as a marketer, had an assignment that was not a marketing assignment that then made me say, oh, well, I've checked the box on that skill. And I think if I want to have a more general management approach, what other skills do I need? And I started to list it and then started to look for opportunities that gave me more and more of those skills. So the chance that somebody could tell me no on an opportunity because I didn't have the skills became smaller and smaller and fewer and fewer. So understand what you need in order to get to your long-term goal. Don't run away from those, um, those assignments and tell yourself a story that's really true and accurate about who you are and your capabilities. Yeah, Libby, excellent, excellent points there. And I'll just say one thing uh, to say, you know, while you're setting a goal for yourself, why don't you make that an audacious goal? Make that something really big something that you wouldn't, you would say that, you know, what am I thinking? Set something out there for you that that brings out the, the best in you that you feel that, you know, uh, oh God, I don't even know that I may be able to do that. And the reason it's important for you to set that goal is the minute you say it, you introduce a realm of possibility into it. Um, so, you know, I think, and the, the, the thing of telling stories to ourselves starts with the goals, like, you know, why aspire for the best, uh, you know, uh, a long time ago, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, I set a big audacious goal for myself and that, in, and, and then when you set that goal for yourself, uh, you know, you don't have to publicize it. It is your personal thing. And then even if you encounter failures along the way, wear those as badges of honor, because, you know, Everything is a story. It's either a story we tell ourselves or it's a story we tell to the world around us. So why don't you make that your story? So, you know, when I joined this uh, fintech uh, in New York, it was a very risky move. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was. I was very, you know, very cushioned job, uh, great brand name, you know, great paycheck coming in. 
Um, but then, you know, uh, after some time into it, you know, when I had to make a decision, I felt that, no, I don't want to continue on that fintech path. I want to, you know, go back to something different. And, you know, you can make those choices just because you've made a decision. You don't have to be like, well, I've got to spend two years in a role or I've got to spend X and I can't be seen as moving around. Um, you know, it's time for you to carve out your own story. Uh, you can say it. And as long as you have the courage of conviction and you're not doing anything, you know, that's uh, illegal or uh, you are know that you're empowered to set a really big goal for yourself, you're allowed to carve out the path that you think gets you there. And even if you do encounter failures along the way, wear those as badges of honor and talk about what you've learned from it, not what happened, uh, not what happened there. I think one of one of the big challenges around this too, and I and I love both of your concepts around kind of creating that story for yourself on on where you want to be, the story you tell yourself, the story you tell others, and setting those audacious goals. I think one of the one of the biggest challenges that that period when that goal setting happens tends to generally overlap with that time period where um, some women may be getting married or considering starting a family or having a family. And that's, that's one area that um, you know, businesses and organizations have not done a great job helping women navigate that period. And it's, um, it's, it's less hard to help women navigate than, than people make it sound. And, and it's certainly a challenging period, but for, for women who really want, who want to do this and make it work, managers can make kind of very slight accommodations that can make the world of difference. So I'm a, my daughter's now uh, just turned 19. Um, and, you know, I had that experience of, of being a mom and managing a team that, that had a lot of women in it. And we had some phenomenal women. And when they would have a child and then they're going for the going to have the second child, they're really struggling with kind of how to make how to make the world work for them. And um, and that's a really difficult period. And and by doing things like, you know, extending leaves, allowing um, women to work from home, have more flexible schedules. Um, you know, to come back four days rather than five at first, do two days from home. You, I kind of, we just kind of, uh, over time, I've had this philosophy with my teams of just do whatever you do, you need to make it work for you. Um, kind of in violation probably of every company policy we probably had at the various companies I've worked at. But for me, when you've got great talent on your team that delivers and performs really, really well, you know, the uptick time to replace with someone new because the person decides to leave because they can't manage it, the training, the development, and, and you might rehire with someone who doesn't have as good a skill set. So if you can find a way to make that situation work for that person, understanding that each person's situation is different, right? We also, I remember I had one woman, she's like, well, my husband's mother's going to come two days a week, but the other two days, you know, I need to be back to daycare to pick up at four. I'm like, okay, perfect. And uh, when I was leaving a job and someone new was taking over my team, um, she was saying, oh, you know, I, I heard there's a lot of angst in your team because of your team's flexible work schedules. And they're worried that I'm not going to, you know, uh, honor those. And they're very worried about that. I'm like, yeah, no, I, I understand that. You know, you, you, you necessarily haven't had a reputation of having a hugely flexible, you know, team. And, and that's how I've, I've run my teams. And she said, well, you know, with this person and that person, like, yeah, well, she works three days, two days from home. This one does this, this one does that. She was, well, I work with those people all the time. I had no idea. I'm like, exactly, right? So they, they also commit in where they're available when they need to be there. Their work product is fabulous. Everyone loves working with them. And that's the piece where, where as managers and leaders, you can make those adjustments for your teams and for the women on your team and keep them in the workforce so that they can set the, those audacious goals and can tell a different story. But when they can't do that, then they're stuck in a safety box, right? In that that frame of this is who I am and what I can do because that's all that's available to me right now. Uh, wow, that, I mean that's a great advertisement for um, you know how to create an environment um, where um, equality can be can be achieved. We just we have like three minutes left. Um, I'd ask maybe each of you, and maybe we start with Libby, just a, a quick minute on how your organization has is tackling this. Um, maybe, you know, might give some ideas to people out there, some ideas they might bring back to their organizations. 
Okay, so I'm going to make this super, super quick, but I would say we're tackling it in a couple of different ways. So from the people perspective and also from the product perspective, uh, it starts at the top. Our CEO, Satya Nadella, is very well known for creating a culture that is always inclusive. And his key word is around empathy. And then empathy goes throughout the entire organization. Our Microsoft US president is a woman by the name of Kate Johnson, and she has put into place what we call empathy in action. And empathy in action has a few different pillars to it that I won't go into the details, but no, it's all around hiring, it's around training, it's around allyship, it's around employee resource groups, making sure that there is an understanding, an awareness, empathy, and then the opportunity to act. And then as it can relates to our products, we also build products that are ensuring that fairness and removal of bias is part of what we do. So for example, in our AI products, that's some of the things that we actually do is build in algorithms that make sure that we remove biases from decision-making as it relates to higher justice, social reform, all of that. Oh, that's terrific. Rupa, how about, um, how about for you? Yeah, I think uh, American Express is long known as a very uh, diverse and inclusive uh, uh, employer. And I will say that, you know, with the, with the year that we have had and the times that we've seen, I think it's very much uh, top of mind. There's a separate diversity, you know, there's more attention I've uh, given to uh, there's more attention, not only at the top, but every hiring leader. Uh, if we are not seeing a diverse slate, we are asking for a diverse slate. Uh, and I and it does. And even if you know the position has been long, been open for too long, you've been interviewing for too long, it doesn't matter. I think it's coming down to every individual hiring leader is empowered to ask to insist on a diverse slate and take as long as it takes to make sure that they have an opportunity to consider all candidates of different backgrounds before a hiring decision is made. Great, who's next, Shannon? I think uh, some of the, um, what other folks have said starts at the top, right? CEO supporting, visibly endorsing um, to culture, right? So how do you create a culture where, where this is something that's just part of how how, how you operate as an organization. And then lastly, I'd say, um, you know, really working to maintain some of the, as I talked about, some of the, the benefits that have come for women in this, in this environment, which is that the flexibility, the virtual work, and, um, and really being able to, to use technology as an, as an equalizer for folks in the workforce. I think if we can maintain that, those two things kind of coming out of this pandemic, I think it'll help us um, escalate a lot of other activities uh, related to advancing women faster. Great, and Barbara. Yeah, so Coca-Cola has a global commitment to diversity and inclusion. We think through the lens of employees, our company and the world. So our Stand as One platform kind of is the overarching strategy for how we approach diversity and inclusion. Many of the commitments that you heard from these other companies are all woven in. Um, our global diversity council, so our women's leadership council, our all of our various um, business resource groups are represented globally, and they're all about driving change within our organization, of how we operate, and how we serve our community around the world. And I think one of the things I'm most proud of is our global commitment to women. Um, our five by twenty program uh, invests in five million women around the world to start and grow their own businesses and to train them to own their futures. It's really powerful. Uh, and I feel very honored to be a part of this company. Well, thanks. And, and um, on behalf of my firm, I would say um, the, the tone at the top is absolutely essential. Um, a lot, of, you know, a lot of people say the right things. Um, the question is, do you really exhibit it and do you and you really get that to cascade through your organization and it starts with um, setting the right example um, and I think that's we've been blessed uh, with our our CEO and our our um, operating committee uh, and their relentless focus on uh, on the subject um, the other thing I would say is um, the uh, a lot of the ideas that we put into place don't come from the executive floor they come from within the organization uh, sometimes from part-time employees or um, our analysts um, all the way up to our CEO, and we're not afraid to try something and fail. Um, and the last thing I would say is we've really reached out beyond um, just our employee base 
and our customer base and really said to ourselves, does it have to be an employee or a customer that we're trying to empower? Um, maybe it's a future customer or employee. So um, we have a, an entrepreneurship in- incubator that really has no connection to what, you know, to our revenues or, or anything like that. Um, but it creates an environment where people come to Morgan Stanley, they can get funded for good ideas. And then maybe somewhere down the line, uh, it pays off. But, you know, we define success as finding that person and helping them get their start. So um, uh, this has been fantastic. I know we went a couple minutes over. I apologize to everyone for that. But uh, what an incredible uh, panel of successful women, Shannon, Libby, Barbara, Rupa. Um, thank you for allowing me to uh, to be on this uh, on this dais with you. It was my uh, my honor, and it was great to meet all of you. Um, and it just reminds me, I'm always um, ranting and raving about what a great place UConn is, um, and it certainly is. Um, but when I have an opportunity to do something like this with people I actually don't know yet, uh, it just reminds me how vast and successful our network is. So. Uh, I will close with Go Huskies, and what a win last night for our women. Uh, um, What a hell of a hell of a win, so uh, put me in a good mood today. Uh, But thank you all for joining, and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.